And for those who enjoy this channel and would love to support us financially, please feel free to hit that donate link. We'd greatly appreciate it. God bless. Darwin was unaware, but Linnaeus changed his view. When he wrote his book, he only learned later in life. Linnaeus' view of, is, of course, the view that Henry Morris picked up on. Not even first in the Genesis Flood, he had written a book earlier, 1946, when he was still on staff at Virginia Tech, I think. He had a number of students come to him and say, well, what do we do with science? We're Christians, how do we mesh the two? So he wrote a book for his students, That You Might Believe. And he said, even as early as 1946, it's well to observe at this point that the Bible does not teach the fixity of species. It's probable that the original Genesis kind is closely akin to what the modern systematist calls a family. And since Linnaeus' time, since Morris's book in 1946, we've got more and more and more examples of different species that can intercross interbreed. This is a liger cross between a, a tiger and a lion. Even Linnaeus' specific example, dog, wolf, and fox that I just showed you here, uh, concluding that the, as a general rule, the kind is the level of family, that rule has held true. As a general rule of thumb, this is a good approximation of what a kind is. The cat family, from lions, tigers, to house cats, all 37 or so species, same kind. So what's so radical about this proposal is, if the kind is the family, well, there's multiple species within the family. And scripture says, Genesis 6 through 9, Genesis 6 and 7, God commands Noah to take two of every kind on board the ark, not of every species. So there were two representatives of this dog, wolf, coyote, fox family, and all the 30 plus species that exist in that family today, which I'm gonna flip through here real fast, all of this variety must have arisen post-flood. The 300 plus dog breeds post-flood. So modern young earth creationists, old young earth creationists, like Linnaeus, all would have espoused this view. They were totally okay with the formation of new species. To use the zebra horse donkey example, there's three recognized living species of zebras that differ in the patterning of their stripes. There's genetic differences among them as well. The one living wild species of, of horse, the Preswaldski's horse, which actually has sometimes uh, bars, primitive stripes on its legs, Onager, the Kiang, the African, the, excuse me, the Asian wild asses and the African wild ass. Those are the seven living species in this family. The 850 plus breeds of horses and donkeys, all part of the same family. All of that from a pair on board the ark. With birds, it gets even more wild. So breeding studies have demonstrated that not just these colorful birds and these colorful birds, but if you, if you comprehensively look at the breeding, over a thousand species of sparrows and finches belong to the same kind. They come from a common kind aboard the ark. So that's a lot of speciation in a short amount of time. And to just to generalize what I'm showing you here. So young earth creationists, of course, would say as a general rule, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, birds were the types of creatures brought on board the ark. There is a few hundred families within these categories, but there's over 30,000 species within mammals and reptiles and amphibians and birds. So that's tens of thousands of new species in a few thousand years. Flood about 4,500-ish years ago. Very different from the evolutionary view. And if, if, if you've been around this debate long enough, you've probably heard our, the evolutionists claim that young earth creationists, when they understand what we actually believe, they think young earth creationists are hyper-evolutionists, believing in way more speciation in such a compressed amount of time, very different from what evolutionists espouse. So this is different from what Darwin proposed in 1859, very different from what Darwin argued against, very different from what Jerry Coyne argues against. So where does that leave us? Let's look at a specific example. 11,000 living bird species today. Let's just assume to keep the math simple that these all formed from a few hundred bird families on board the ark at a constant rate. <laughs> the changing rates makes the math complicated, so we'll keep it simple. So 11,000 divided by 4,500 years gives you an average rate of 2.4 new bird species per year. Now that could have been a, a burst of speciation immediately following the flood that's tapered off to the present still averages out to 2.4 new bird species per year. And to show you how different this is from the evolutionary model, so they of course say birds evolved from dinosaurs. Dinosaurs, they say, went extinct 65 million years ago. You've got to give some time for those dinosaur ancestors to evolve through the transitional forms to the modern birds. If you look at the evolutionary literature, they'd say the modern birds 
the 11,000 species began speciating about 35 million years ago. So let's use that number. 35 million divided by 11,000 species gives you one new species every 3,200 years. That's around the time of King David. So they say one new species every King David and nothing since. So in 3,200 years, at the rate I just told you, 2.4 gives you close to 8,000 new species. So there's orders of magnitude difference, which shouldn't be surprising because the time scales, 35 million versus 4,500, are also orders of magnitude different. But there's something vital that I don't want you to miss here. This number is a testable, falsifiable prediction. That's something you can go out into the field and test. Something, the type of calculation I put in print last fall. So this is a huge advance in the debate. They can't use that objection anymore. 40-year-old objection. Give us something testable, falsifiable. I was at the NEA convention, National Educators Association, no bastion of conservatism, just last week. And that came up there. Oh, you, it's, it's not science. It doesn't have testable predictions. We were giving away that book because it's such a liberal place. Uh, but. <laughs> Very difficult because when people can buy the booth and say, you know, you couldn't pay me to take your book. So there's great stereotypes that have to be overcome. But the point is, they were raising those objections and those objections no longer hold. So now the story that I've wanted to tell you that I think gives the relevance of this book in a way I never would have anticipated. Back to Darwin's Finches. Let's tie all four of these stories together. In 1981, a male of the large cactus finch, and I'll have a bigger image of each of these species here in a moment. A male of the large cactus finch migrated over to Daphne Major, the island that Grants have been studying for four decades, mated with several medium ground finch females. This is a family tree. The circles are females. The squares are males. You can see F0 represents the parental generation. F1 is the first offspring, first filial. But the offspring generation, then they have offspring, they have offspring, so forth. And the bars connect the horizontal lines connect mating. So this guy mates with a bunch of females. Most of those offspring just get absorbed into the medium ground finch population. But by generation three, in this particular mating, you can see there's a close relative mating. And here, their offspring become reproductively isolated. So they're building nests on the same island as that medium ground finch, but they're not intermating. Part of it has to do with the mating call that's learned through the father and anyway details don't really matter here the point is these guys have become reproductively isolated they're not mating with other species these guys have a different beak size than either the, that parent or that parent or parental species and i'll show you that in a minute and because the grants are very thorough researchers and have been taking tissue samples from every single individual that they banned they can now look at these blood samples, get the DNA, and these guys are genetically distinct. So basically everything that defines a new species, reproductive isolation, morphological differences, genetic differences, has been observed since 1981. And so in 2018, January this year in Science Magazine, they announced rapid hybrid speciation in Darwin's finches. They were hesitant to give it a new species name because there's only about 35 individuals, but here's that big bird lineage. Here's the large cactus finch you can see his beak size, the, the male that flew over. This is the male of the medium ground finch, Geospiza fortis. And this guy has a beak size that's bigger than that medium ground finch. And it's, it, it's, it's distinct. So, new species forms. By the way, uh, 2015, the scientific community went back to the Galapagos Islands to say, are there, are there any finch species we might have missed initially in the, in the counting? And they did some comprehensive genetics of the birds, and they said, actually, there's, we've missed about four. So the, the, the recognized total number of species before this study was up to 18. And of course, now they've observed this new species form. Well, what does that imply about the testable predictions put in print several months prior in my book? So 18, 18 species of Darwin's finches recognized. First one's discovered, 1837, with John Gould as a result of Darwin's voyage on the Beagle. That's 181 years ago. One new species in 181 years. So one divided by 100 is 0.01. One divided by 200 is 0.005. It's a lot less than 2.4. That would seem to be a refutation, but only at first pass, because 2.4 new bird species per year is a rate that represents a global rate. 2.4 new bird species per year means that somewhere in the world, a pelican or an osprey or an eagle or a finch or a goldfinch or a bird of paradise, something is going to form a new species. Two to three species are going to form new ones. And Darwin's finches represent a small fraction 
of the total global bird population. So we have to apply a correction factor. One new species divided by 181 years, divided by 18 times 11,000 to, to compare it to the rate I published. So let's line these numbers up in a row. One new species for evolution, one new species every King David is 0. 0.0003 new bird species per year, per 11,000 species globally. Creationist prediction is much higher, 2.4 new bird species per year. One divided by 181, divided by 18 times 11,000 gives you a rate of 3.4 new bird species per year. So that's analogous to saying the following. Let's say NFL football, political disputes notwithstanding, is still being played in 2050. And I say to you, I can predict for you in 2050 who's going to be playing in the Super Bowl, and I'm predicting for you the final score. And lo and behold, NFL football survives to 2050, and the exact two teams that I predicted are playing, and I predict the final score, and I'm off by a field goal. You'd still say that was pretty good. That's what this number represents. It's just, it's even faster. In fact, uh, this is even an entirely fair comparison. So these numbers implicitly incorporate the rates of extinction. These are long-term speciation rates. This is a short-term speciation rate. So this rate might actually decrease as this, you know, it's only 35 individuals. They could go extinct. But uh, I've got a whole article that discusses the nuances. But this is a really interesting initial study. I knew of no studies that did a comprehensive measurement of speciation like this. So in the icon of evolution, We've observed a rate of speciation almost exactly in line with what the Young Earth Biblical Time Scale predicts and in severe conflict with what evolution predicts. Couldn't come in a more ironic example. So the bottom line is this idea is working. People complain and, and object and say, well, how can you have 30,000 new species form in just a few thousand years? How? As if this is a, a question of plausibility. How, how could it happen? Well, we don't even need to worry about that because we've already seen it happen. It's already been documented at rates we've, we've expected. This is not working. So Darwin's finches, the exhibit A for evolution for 40 years, is confirming the falsifiable, testable predictions of the creation model. The rate of speciation in these finches is matching up almost exactly with what we've predicted. And it's in conflict. It's basically disproving the evolutionary model. So this is a big bombshell. That's what I think makes this book so relevant. For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started.